Cool. Thanks again. Over to you, Michael. Wonderful. Hopefully you can hear me. Excellent. This is what I'm going to say. So let me not tell you that. Um, let's get straight into it. So I think um, we've done a huge amount of work on performance in Collabor Online in the last year. And it'd just be great to, to show you uh, some of the things there. But to do that, we need to understand really how it's uh, working. So of course, uh, you know, we build on the LibreOffice technology. So on the uh, on the server, we have effectively a LibreOffice in a in a box, um, and we we're talking about the secure containment of that earlier. It's it's very locked down box, but it's running there, and that then streams tiles to the client as uh, PNG images, uh, with with various smarts around that, um, and the kit behaves in a different way to a normal LibreOffice. So it's essentially fully zoomed out. So you see a view you never see uh, on, on your normal uh, PC, unless you have a very small document. There's a view of this giant a giant document there. And that's very important so we can track when things change uh, because we cache a lot of things on the client to make it much more responsive. So yeah, and then of course there are multiple views of that, which is very similar to creating a new window. So in, in LibreOffice, you can create multiple windows of your current document and get multiple views on it. And we essentially reuse that code with a number of, um, well, changes and. Uh, improvements around that, all of which is built into the core. Uh, on top of that, then we have a daemon that multiplexes messages from all of the users to many of these isolated kits. And uh, that's, yeah, I mean, there's another source of performance problems there, potentially. And so messages are sent from the kit, the web service daemon to sometimes a proxy, uh, and then to the, the actual browser on the other end. Um, and yeah, so useful to see how that works. And then of course, in the browser, we have a relatively thin piece of JavaScript. Um, not, not too much going on there. Um, but we do lots of things to try and make things quicker. So we have overlays for cursors. So your cursor blinking is not causing any bandwidth uh, you know, uh, to be used or wasted. Uh, your selections or overlays there. As you pan and zoom, uh, we interpolate on the client so you get a very fluid, uh, a smooth uh, experience there. So that's, that, that's pretty much how it works. And when you understand that, uh, maybe you can um, maybe you can get further. Um, and of course, if you understand JavaScript, you'll realize it's a garbage collected language for almost everything, which means that uh, the people that write JavaScript forget that you need to free stuff. Uh, and, and so the few things that aren't garbage collected, like timers, uh, they typically leak horribly. So you know they create a timer that's got a period of 10 milliseconds or something, 50 milliseconds, and they just leave it running forever. And so often, often it's very common experience as you use the web, that you know the CPU of your browser process goes up and up and up until it uh, you know your, your laptop just sits there warming the room, and uh, think what carbon we could save if uh, you know time is actually completed uh, properly uh, everywhere and so on. So uh, we don't have big problems in in Collabor Online around that now. I guess many of us are, are used to freeing things, having created them from a C plus plus world, um, but certainly some of the integrations that we sit inside have have embarrassing leaks of this kind. I'm not primarily talking about uh, the form of uh, battery power and so on. I I'm fundamentally talking about uh, responsiveness and so on. So let's look at the stuff that's actually happening in the LibreOffice core. I think I, I talked about this before. Uh, and one of the typical test methodologies of our users is to uh, load a document with eight, eight people in it and then just hammer the keyboard like you know, with, with, with two flippers. And it turns out that you can do this you know, 10 times uh, faster than uh, a normal average typist. Now, to be fair, I can I can type uh, you know about three times uh, as slow as as just mashing the keyboard randomly, but arguably what I say is nonsense anyway. So you know you're not winning. But the real problem here is rendering the squiggly lines underneath for misspelled things, and it turns out the misspelled rendering was incredibly slower uh, than rendering uh, well all the rest of the document. Really amazing. I think ninety percent of the CPU time drawing these red lines, which are the most beautifully crafted anti-aliased, you know, B-splines with all these control points are sitting there. And it turns out, of course, this is really slowing down LibreOffice as well. You know, if you, if you have a large spreadsheet with lots of repeated names, or if you had a document with the wrong language set, which is quite common, uh, you know, you get a lot of red lines squiggly uh, everywhere. And, you know, there's a real problem there. Luckily, we've, we've fixed that. Of course, that's upstream. And we render a little bit of a red, red squiggle, and then we, we do bitmaps to uh, cache that, uh, which just disappears off the profile, which is encouraging. One of the problems we had, and particularly in our mobile version on Android, was this performance of uh, editing text shapes in press. So, so when you would start to edit, uh, you know, we would we would click, 
uh, to, to select the, the text, you know, and that's just a tap. And then you'd expect to get a keyboard and be able to, well, edit the text, really. Um, but it was taking initially something like five seconds to, to actually get the keyboard up, during which time people had tapped a whole lot more. And it's just unshippably bad. And, and so one of the problems there was just setting up the property panels. We just love to uh, parse some XML that describes the property panel, create all of these uh, you know, little widgets, uh, routinely re relay them out continually while we're doing that, and then uh, throw them away again uh, shortly afterwards uh, before then creating them again, and often several times during the, uh, during the process of, of changing context. So I mean, when you click in there, the sidebar notionally changes the, changes the context. So yeah, it's really, really silly. Um, but, but after that, then uh, just drawing the dashed line around the edit text box, um, you know, we can see, see one of those here. Um, unfortunately, this was subdivided uh, into a whole series of lines, uh, which are all rendered as one batch. And so there's a lot of self-intersection. You know, if you've ever drawn a doodle and colored in, you know, like colored it in, as, as probably you're doing now whilst listening to me, um, you know, it's actually quite expensive doing that winding um, business of what lines and shapes overlap each other and do they intersect. And when you create lots and lots and lots of dashes, you, you have this, well, it's really quite an expensive computational problem to work out if they intersect. Um, but of course, as you draw the line, you know, this is a nonsense, they don't intersect at all. So, so on the dash line rendering, Armin um, did some work for us to, to short circuit this and accelerate the dash line rendering, huge, huge impact. Uh, pr practically got rid of that. But it, again, it's it's not necessarily the thing you expect that takes the time rendering a, a slide. You wouldn't think that it would be the dashed line around the text box, uh, but so it was, and it isn't now, uh, both in LibreOffice and in uh, Collabor Online. Uh, simply the sidebar, um, a couple of things there, like just deferring, setting up the sidebar until you actually need it, it's helpful, uh, but particularly caching the panels so that they're always there, they're just not necessarily visible. So we, we, we hide them away at very small sizes. And then we can just you know, relay those out to, to sh show that in a cached way, way quicker for all desktop users, less flicker, less CPU time, um, just, just a lot, lot better. Um, and I, I guess, I think actually that's all been redone recently for using native widgets. So probably we'll have to re-look re at that uh, caching thing, but yeah, you know, it's good to have native widgets. So, uh, and we're, we're looking forward to shipping that in the next Collabor Online um, with much, much prettier sidebar. So Jason, uh, Jason. <laughs> so uh, generating Jason is is quite important for us in terms of uh, getting that sidebar to the client, so that we can make this uh, mobile phone one one handed uh, user experience. And yeah, so we then describe all these widgets, each of which can describe itself in Jason, which is great. So we used to have this dumpers property property tree method here, and that would essentially create an abstract uh, tree structure thing, this property tree, p-tree. Um, and for each one, we'd create that. But the problem is that each one contains its nested elements. So we would just stack these things up inside each other, allocating and freeing endlessly and, and, and incredibly inefficient um, for what is ultimately just streaming out a se sequence of text. Uh, so, you know, this, this boost property tree thing turned out to be a complete nightmare. Uh, and so instead, now we have a nice fast uh, JSON writer, which uses some of the optimized string streaming functionality we have in, in the LibreOffice core. Um, so yeah, thanks again to Noel, who's uh, disappeared that from the profile, which is uh, fantastic. Um, image scaling and rendering. Yeah, so, well, uh, lots of scaling for, for various reasons. You can see here that, uh, you know, this is a very, very slow, slow process. And, uh, you know, we do it several times. We, we, we scale it uh, during some... Uh, idle redraw or painting of the page, complete redraw, and then also um, while, while we're painting tiles. And interestingly, this whole piece here doesn't, doesn't need doing, and, and Lubosch, I think, has removed that. Um, but one of the problems was that though we had a very nice scaling cache, it wasn't really prepared for having multiple windows at different zoom levels. Um, and so it wasn't, for random reasons, we had a, a window in the background that was a different resolution. And so we were continually rescaling images to render them. Total nonsense. So now, uh, you know, we scale and we cache, um, cache those at multiple zoom levels. So as you zoom in and out in your PC, LibreOffice, that's then quicker. Um, and uh, of course, we can, um, we actually extended that to, to cache depending on the number of views you have, because lots of different users can be at different zoom levels. Uh, so that's, that's great. And LibreOffice uh, fixed that. So hopefully lots of improvements there. 
Um, writer loves to uh, very carefully count all of the areas it's invalidated. And you remember I, I said that you're seeing a whole writer document, like it's a massive, uh, massive window, which is very, uh, very unusual to have a whole document. If you think of a 300 page document, all of it in view at the same time. And so there's this, this notional optimization that supposedly compresses regions by merging them together. And uh, yeah, the algorithm is pretty horrific. horrific. It's uh, something like n cubed in the number of regions. And if you consider a document with lots of fields in it, uh, so like a bullet is a field, and as you move into or out of a bullet region, uh, often we you know, invalidate all those bullets to render them with a gray field mark. Um, so you can suddenly end up with, well, thousands of items going through this n cubed loop, uh, which before you know it is billions of operations are doing, doing stuff. And yeah, so this is just a nonsense. So actually Miklos did some great work here to not invalidate bullets and render them as you move into them because well, it's kind of a bit of a silly feature. And uh, yeah, now we have this, uh, it's only n squared. So that, that's kind of nice. Uh, and I think Noel has, has worked with Lubosh and there's some more kind of sorting and optimizing of that to make it even more efficient. Uh, which, well, hopefully that will accelerate all large writer documents uh, that, are, that are rendered. Similarly, in Calc, um, we have this, uh, well, this get print area thing is called, called as you switch views for various reasons, partly to work out where to draw page boundaries, I think, uh, so you can draw lines on that. Um, but Calc is a particularly nasty problem. So the pixel area is dependent on zoom. So, so as you zoom in, it's very important that all your rows that are the same notional print height are the same pixel height on the screen um, for two reasons. Probably the, the subclinical neurosis of, of, of spreadsheet workers means that it avoids them trying to resize it to make them all the same height on the screen. And then as they zoom, they're different heights again. Um, but I think there's an important aesthetic uh, thing there. But it does mean that you have to scan from the beginning of the document to work out the pixel position of, of any cell, which is really expensive. And there was a whole load of uh, problems here that would essentially you, you're getting a row, uh, you know, trying to work out which row you're at for a given height is, is, is important. And well, it's now massively faster. We have span trees for hidden rows and span trees for row heights, and those can be non contiguous. And, uh, you know, so now instead of uh, kind of doing row by row checking of some of these, we, we intersect these span trees and work out optimal regions that, that match. So we can go, oh, yeah, well, these are all that height, but they're all hidden. And then there's some more of that height, but they're visible so that we can calculate uh, the, the, the pixel rounding problems uh, that get compound as you get down and down and down larger sheets uh, much more quickly. So that's again, very useful for LibreOffice. And there's a lot more in, in core. I, I think Noel had a lot of uh, good uh, pointers on getting involved in performance. I, I'm, I'm personally quite passionate about it. I just get no time. Uh, for it, but Noel's done lots of things. There are lots, you know, faster file opening, better font caching for text rendering, uh, faster scrolling, uh, you know, spreadsheets, improved spreadsheet filtering, which took a lot of time, uh, big chart insertion setup problems and so on. And yeah, I mean, in, in LibreOffice Kit, Lubosh has done some, some great stuff. We used to calculate and paint and lay out the whole document in order to render it to an invisible surface, which is like one by one pixels large. And uh, so avoiding lots of lots of that layout uh, overhead and, and rendering overhead uh, was just just not not useful. So I think at this point we get a detail overload. There's really loads of stuff that's been fixed, and uh, all of that's shared with LibreOffice uh, helps improve uh, performance there. And interestingly, the way online renders is increasingly how every every modern toolkit should be rendering. So in idle and validation rendering, rather than trying to do it immediately when you type keys and so on. And so hopefully lots of that helps improve the future. Uh, you know, as we move to a, a sort of a uniform skier Cairo type rendering model, my hope is that that's, you know, it's not done immediately, it's done ideally. And so we can start to get rid of the back buffers and the, well, some of this other nonsense that we don't need and uh, really, you know, reduce memory use, improve performance and just integrate better with the underlying operating system. So then there's the web services daemon. Um, so we had some really silly things in there. So one of the things that it does is, is it shuffles memory from the kit uh, to the web services daemon to the client. And, you know, we buffer our data. Obviously, it's important that, you know, we, we make messages and we store them in a standard vector. And then we transmit them, you know, from the beginning. And we used to, you know, transmit a chunk and then erase it. And that, if you've got a lot of data, a 20 megabyte image, for example, I mean, shuffling all of that data down, you know, and then it gets smaller and smaller, but not very quickly. 
Um, so, you know, SSL will only allow you to write a 16K chunk maximum. So if you shuffle 10 megabytes down through a 16K chunk, you get 1,200 uh, vector copies, uh, which is, you know, on average, 10, 10 megabytes uh, each copy, which is really not fast, uh, and particularly on a mobile phone or device there. Um, so, well, anyway, we inserted a buffer class that wraps this, and we don't erase. We have, a, we have an offset there, and, well, bingo. Um, so we shuffle then a megabyte at a time instead of 16K at a time, and, well, you're 64 times faster, which is, is very, very visible. Another problem with STL on Android is just it's just amazing. I mean, you know, when we first used and compiled uh, LibreOffice for Android, it turned out we had to binary patch all sorts of bits of, uh, you know, actual core uh, STL library out uh, at the bottom, which is really embarrassing. So, you know, they're just live runtime bugs in, that would make LibreOffice not even start. Um, so I don't think we have to binary patch those anymore, but I think the assembler to do it is still in there to kind of mend Android to the very basics so we could start. Uh, but this, you know, destroying vectors should not be on the profile. I mean, like, you should not have a loop that assigns all of these items to zero. It should, you know, well, but, but here you are. Here you can see it. I mean, you, you don't believe me. I didn't believe it either. But here we are, you know, sort of creating and destroying uh, these buffers. And it's not even in the memory allocation subsystem, uh, particularly. It's, you know, it's like clearing, clearing a vector shouldn't, you know, like shouldn't be taking time. You can see you know, when, when you destroy a vector, you should, anyway. These are all vectors of char, you know, they're just like byte buffers. And so, so the vector madness on Android is taking far longer than actually, you know, the scaling the bitmaps, which we found out was a problem, uh, and, you know, and rendering stuff. Kind of really silly. So anyway, we fixed that. And then key events. So on a heavy load, you know, actually, it turns out you can't process the key events quick enough. So what you really need to be doing is uh, merging together. So Tor has done some great work here to, you know, turn your FOO into a single foo input to try and collapse that backlog and to, you know, because there's a whole load of things as you insert text, there's a lot of work that's done in the document. Um, and as you switch context and so on, there's work done. And so, so we can then catch up uh, much, much more effectively. And similarly for uh, removing text context, which is kind of a backspace delete event, merging those together. And I, I don't know actually if we merge uh, these things into each other, uh, but probably we should be doing that too. So uh, it would be, it'd be nice if, if someone wants to hack on, you know, kind of, optimizing that uh, before it goes in there in the queue, just to shrink the input queue. Another huge win um, was that previously we had to pause all of our ed document editing during save uh, and upload. So a LibreOffice save is usually pretty quick. We've done lots of work to optimize that, at least for reasonably sized documents. It's, you know, way sub-second and, and, and very, very flash, uh, which is cool. But the upload, which we assumed would be fast, you know, like in, in the same data center from one machine to another machine, sending a 10 megabyte document uh, from autosave, uh, it turns out that this can take several seconds. Um, uh, just, just sending that, committing it, making sure it's saved to an object storage, which can be, you know, some, some big cluster of, of uh, magic machines and so on. And this is not something that's been optimized in terms of end-to-end -end, uh, round trip, you know, an, an atomic transaction time. Because usually that's not, not a problem for uh, enterprise file sync and share. You know, like there's plenty of time to do your upload and background synchronization. So thanks to Ash, we've done a whole lot of work in the core to uh, allow us to do that asynchronously so that the saving is going on and you don't stall your typing. So, you know, there isn't a, a jerk uh, while you're typing. Um, that is just streaming out uh, and committing in the background. And that, that's quite a complex piece of work. And that arrived in 6.4.11 uh, and, well, 6.4.10. Maybe in the six four nine six four somewhere there. Anyway, there's been a lot of work to make that really, really robust and catch lots of corner cases. And you know, when things are happening asynchronously and your save is going on while you're closing, you know, doing another edit and closing the document, there's lots of interactions there that are really worth getting right and, and testing and, and, and tracking and so on. So even so, there are some synchronous things there. So if you're renaming, for example, it's really important that we've actually done the rename and switched to the new document before allowing you to type again. So uh, Pedro has made some beautiful animations for, for this, and for the core piece where we can't make it asynchronous yet, though we have a plan for that, there's, there's a nice animation there as you as you save your document, which is kind of cool. So JavaScript, yes, I told you about JavaScript earlier. Um, turns out that we thought that most of our performance problems were either in the network or in the web service daemon or in LibreOffice, but actually, found that we'd uh, been really misfocusing our optimization. Lots of the performance problems really in the JavaScript and in the browser, which was really unexpected. 
Um, and we found one of these, and then then Tor went and made a, a beautiful end-to-end -end profile. So in three, we can see uh, stuff going well. As Torbine said, it's not quite end-to-end. -end. Like when you press a key press, it's hard to trace that through the pieces and back again. But uh, well, anyway, um, yeah. So so so, but but at least it shows you everything that's going on in in a, in a synchronized way. And you can turn that on, and then you can see you know an event happening in the browser, being sent, being received, being processed, and tiles uh, coming coming back. So that's, that's really useful. And uh, yeah, be, be careful with your JavaScript. It turns out there's a whole lot of silly things. So, so one of the things that was particularly annoying was that you could see tiles render one by one. So, you know, if you did something, you would, you know, if you look at a profile, you could actually see things like that. So as you hit page down and a new part of the spreadsheet was revealed, you know, you'd actually see tile artifacts, which is, which is kind of awful. And it turns out this is actually a feature. So, so uh, <clears throat> we were unaware of the fact it was a feature, but it seems that we were sending WebSocket messages one by one to get them down the pipe as quickly as possible. And the browser is processing WebSocket messages one by one by one by one, and in between, it re-renders everything. So, you know, as you would as you would get your tile, the new image, it would essentially re-render. I mean, it was creating a video for you of what was going on. Um, exactly what we don't want, because of course, while it was doing that, it was blocking. Um, any other input coming, and it was actually buffering these things very aggressively. So it's like a 128k buffer in, in the background, um, both outbound and inbound on the web socket. And so this is just a bit ridiculous. So huh, um, I, there's a comment about it here, I guess. So what, what do we do? Well, we had a, we had a sleep, and everything gets much quicker. Um, so so what we do is essentially we um, we uh, read our web socket very quickly, uh, and we don't do anything with that message that will touch the DOM. Uh, we don't redraw or do anything, we just queue it all up. So we slurp uh, loads of content off the socket. And uh, yeah, and then a millisecond later, when we've you know read it all in, uh, then we process it and render that on the screen. And so that was pretty cool. That, that made things a lot better. Um, and, and you can see, uh, what can you see? What is this? Well, yeah, so, so one of the other problems was that having done this, we were all happy and everything, but it still didn't seem quite as good as it could be. And so asynchronous image loading turns out, turns out that even if you have all of the image data in your hand as an image URL, and you want to create an image out of it, you can't do it. You have to do it asynchronously because the browser was fed up of people you know, asking synchronous web requests that were slow. And so this... Broadly, no shortcut, it seems, for, well, I have all of the data, please give me an image. It's, again, asynchronous. So anyhow, so once we put that in to then wait until the image actually was there, then uh, finally we could then uh, get, get this working. So we then emit all of our events that are complete, meaning, you know, we've got the image data, everything is in hand, uh, so we can render quickly. And then suddenly, you know, as you page down, you, you, you get pretty much a, a whole screen full, which is kind of cool. Another big problem we found was uh, just the GC pressure from loading, uh, converting images. Uh, so, so image formats are a bit of a problem. Uh, and we, we need to use image URLs, which are base64 uh, encoded to get them in. And well, th there was a whole load of string copying there. I mean, essentially what we were doing was this. We were doing, you know, appending a, a, a character to a string uh, and then doing this base64 encoding okay, in a simple piece of code. But it essentially piles up ever longer strings, uh, which are then garbage collected by JavaScript. And, and this makes just an incredible waste. So instead, it's much better if you pass all of those parameters as arguments to a function uh, using a rather more magic uh, JavaScript uh, feature uh, with this data slice and so on, um, which was great. So we implemented that. And then we discovered that we blew the stack if we had particularly complex images. So amazingly, everything worked fine. Well, you had a white document, but when you had like white noise in your document, you got a very large thing and you blow the JavaScript stack. So, well, anyway, now we use, uh, you know, we, we only pass 4,000 4K parameters to the function and amazingly faster and much less GC pressure. And we'd love to uh, repeat the work, the same work the whole time. So, you know, we get multiple cursor updates. If you hold your, your arrow down in calc, you get several at a time. And we would then just be scrolling and doing all this calculation uh, until we, you know, to process the queue. So, well, just delay those to the end. Um, the table handling, we love to send, continually send bogus table uh, messages about the table handles, you know, for resizing and sizing tables. So as you typed in a table, every character you send would create and destroy loads of these, these handles, you know, like half a second's worth of 
you know, Dom fooling around, creating and handling those messages, all of them duplicate. Uh, so, well, 15 times faster to do it just once. Michael, and, yeah, you have about four minutes left. I'm, uh, thank you. I have a, a timer here, four minutes, 38 seconds. But thanks, Gillen. You're, you're, uh, you're, you're wonderful. And I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So now we have a messages done event that just does all of this at the end uh, when those are all slurped. Um, the jQuery plugin, we, we discovered this actually from writing profiling tools. Uh, so we, we had a profiler. Uh, so you can run the whole JavaScript uh, editing session. And you can run like five or six random typers, which is our, our bet noir, as it were. And we can run them all in parallel and see what's going on as we rushed it, you know, run it through the JavaScript code. And it turns out that there's some just, you know, cargo culting of a jQuery plugin to do something totally unimportant uh, that then was taking 800 milliseconds. Of course, with, with the JS DOM, it took five seconds on, on startup. So you really saw it. Um, and Merth fixed that now. So, so our Google, uh, our old, traditional uh, user experience with menus and, and toolbar is then just massively faster to start now, which is kind of good. So yeah, profiling is good. So anyway, here are the conclusions. We're much faster. We did a lot of work. Uh, lots of that is in LibreOffice 7.2, the core work. More of it's coming in 7.3. A whole lot of it is already shipping in uh, Cool 6.4.11, uh, but some of it is the more risky pieces in terms of adjusting rendering and avoiding a bits of invalidations coming in uh, 2021 uh, in the next uh, month or so, month or two. Uh, there's a lot more work to be done here. Um, we're writing stressing and profiling tools that replay traces and, and load, load the code. Uh, and yeah, we're, we're not even nearly done yet. I, I think there's a factor of two, at least almost everywhere you look. So uh, yeah, so the real trick then is just knowing what to optimize now and looking at the profiles and focusing that work on on things. So yeah, thank you for everyone that's done lots of uh, hard work there. And well, it all drives our mission to make open source rock. And uh, that's my talk. Any questions? Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Kim. And I don't see any question on the chat. Like, uh, people might be amazed at how uh, amazingly the performance has improved in the past year. I don't know. <laughs> yes, it's possible. Uh, well, they just be, you know, hitting their heads. You know, we, we found a lot of really silly things there, and you know, well, I don't know. Until you yeah. profile and you have time to, uh, you know, look at these things, you don't, you don't catch the sillies. So, you know, it's really, it's really great to have well, time and an economic incentive then to chase a performance and, and really improve that yeah. for everyone. So maybe like one short question for me is it? So, so you mentioned you had the complexity of uh, big O of N three at some point. Yes. Uh, that you uh, kind of shrank into uh, big of N2 instead. And mm. does that apply to the desktop version as well? Yes, because... yes, absolutely. All so right, all yeah. of that okay. stuff was um, in, in the desktop. Now, of mm -hmm. course, it's uh, the N there is the number of invalidation regions on the screen. Um, possibly see that if you have a, a large writer document well zoomed out and say lots of bullets and fields invalidations. Yeah. Um, you know, it's easy to criticize programmers. The reality is we're using the code in a way that they didn't expect it to. And so it, you know, it makes perfect sense to write an n-cubed algorithm if you have a small n. You know, if it's ten, then there's not really a problem. But when it's ten thousand, you have an epic problem. And so, yeah, I mean, you can't blame the code, uh, but it should improve prove that for everyone. So yeah, much of the work here is is in the core and gone back into it. I think you know the, the first third of my talk or, or, or two thirds, uh, two fifths was probably about that.